the remedy for all your problems. That's my subject. The remedy for all your problems. I am a Jamaican and I'm sure most, if not all of us, are Jamaicans in the congregation. And as Jamaicans, you know we have a remedy for everything. Amen. If you have coal, you can use fresh cut or fever grass. If you have constipation or menstrual problems, you can use mojo herb. You know mojo herb? No. All right. If you have belly ache, nausea, or pipes, or your poison, you can use busy. You know busy? All right. You're working with me. If you have whooping cough, I don't know if people still have those things. But if you have whooping cough, you can drink rat soup. Oh, did anybody hear that one? All right. If you have chicken pox, then you can use some tamarind leaves for chicken pox. You know that one. If you suffer from impotence, then you can have some moringa. Amen, somebody. If you have mugs, you can use tobacco leaf to put around the, the area. Jamaicans have a remedy for everything. And I think it's probably only a matter of time before Jamaicans find the remedy for COVID. We live in an age where there are vaccines for everything. There's a vaccine for everything. And if there isn't a vaccine, then there is a medicine. In a capsule or a tablet or injection, there is a medicine. And if the medicine is not yet available, it is being worked on. It's being discovered, it's being worked on in the lab. But I want to turn I want you to turn your Bible with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And let's start at verse 1. Isaiah 6 and verse 1. I want to talk to us about a problem that is bigger than all of the ailments that I've just mentioned. I want to talk to us about a problem called sin. We live in an age where sin has become even more increasingly sinful. Because persons are so up in the face of God with their sinning that we want to have a word, we want to talk this morning, this afternoon. Verse 1, are you there in your Bibles? It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another. And said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole of our earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6. Then blew one of the servants unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the dogs from the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth. And said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Let's go back to verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah is dead. What are we going to do? Uzziah was a stalwart. He reigned for 52 years. 52 years. That's over half of a century. Now, we know that we're going into election times and some of you in the congregation may only have known a few prime ministers. But I'm telling you that King Uzziah reigned 52 years. Most persons never knew another king. King Uzziah is dead. What are we going to do? The leader for half of a century is now gone. The Assyrians are now upon us. This was a man who took a bold stance against the Assyrians. What are we going to do? 
Are we going to fall prey to the Assyrian because King Uzziah is now dead? This was a time of peril, a time of crisis. They were fearful because they knew that the Assyrians were upon them. King Uzziah is dead. But the challenge was not so much that King Uzziah died. The challenge was with the people. Because the people were sinning and they continued to sin. So God was withdrawing his hand of protection from them. So naturally what's going to happen is that they're going to be taken over. Uzziah took a strong stance. What is going to be the fate of Judah? The Assyrians were invincible. The Assyrians, it, it, it only seemed like a matter of time before Judah would become captive. But I want to share with us that when you feel like you're overwhelmed, when you feel like you can't go anywhere, when you feel like the world is crushing down upon your shoulders, God has an answer. When you feel like you've gone too far away from God, you've strayed, you've sinned, there is still a God that you can run to. Uzziah was dead. But his death was necessary for a man named Isaiah to acknowledge his calling to prophetic ministry, to prophetic office. In the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. I was in Harrison and we were studying this text. And a brother, Brother Ken Allen, said to me, Brother Allen, was Uzziah blocking God? Was Uzziah blocking God? And I thought about it. Was Uzziah blocking God from Isaiah? The text says, in the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. There are some of us in church that may be blocking some people from coming in. There are some of us by our conduct may be keeping a prospective brother and sister away. There are some of us by the way we carry ourselves that the folks are saying I don't want to be a part of that congregation. Are you blocking somebody from coming to Jesus? I look at Zacchaeus and my, in, 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 in my estimation, I don't think Zacchaeus was short. I think the crowd was too tall. The crowd was too tall so Zacchaeus couldn't get to Jesus. The man who they had to let lower down through the roof because the crowd was so tall they couldn't get to Jesus. Are you blocking somebody from getting to Jesus? Are you an Uzziah? That's the question that I'm asking. What is the Uzziah that is in our life? It may not be people. It may be some things. Yeah. Is our car blocking us from God? Is our house blocking us from God? Are our spouses blocking us from God? Are our addictions blocking us from God? Is our procrastination blocking us from the relationship that we ought to have with Jesus Christ? What is your Uzziah? What is stopping you from seeing the Lord high and lifted up? We need to get rid of our Uzziah. But Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Now it's important that we see the Lord sitting on a throne because God wanted Isaiah to understand that despite what was going on, I am still a God that sits high and I look low. I am still in charge of the affairs of men. I am still the one that is the one that has chosen this people. And even though the majority may be wandering away from me, I still have a remnant. Isaiah saw God high and lifted up. I want to share with you that despite the COVID-19 that is ravishing these many countries, God is still in control. Despite the crime and the violence that we're seeing in this country, called Jamaica, God is still in control. Despite the fact that the US dollar is at 150 to 1, God is still in control. 
soul, despite the fact that you have lost your job. Your spouse may have left you, but God is still in control. In Psalm 73, when the psalmist took a look around him, he saw that the wicked were prospering. Now I come to church every day. I pay my tithe and I give my offering. I can't even find a little work. I can't even put food on my table. I can't even afford to send my, my, my children to school. But God and the one that's picking you up every day. What are going to be God? Psalm 73. The psalm is look at. Let's, let's turn here. Let's turn your Bibles to Psalm 73. Let's, let's, let's go there for a few minutes. Psalm chapter 73. This psalm is not a psalm of David. This is a psalm of Asa. And I'm looking at the New Living Translation. It says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are poor, pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I almost gone, for I envisioned the throne when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with the problems like everybody else. They wear pride like jewels, necklaces, and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat chats have everything their hands could ever wish for. They scoff and they speak evil. And in pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know? They ask. Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. I'm happy he said that I almost lost my food. I'm happy that the psalm didn't end there. I'm happy that there's verse 17 in the psalm that says, Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly, you put them onto a slippery path and sent them sliding over the cliff to destruction. Now watch what go on with anybody else. Focus on God. See your God high and lifted up. Because that's what he wants you to see. We serve a risen Savior that's in the world today. I know that he's living. Whatever, I said whatever, whatever men may say, he's God and he's still in charge. He is God and he's still in charge of the affairs of this planet. He's large and he's in charge because he's God. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Where are you seeing God? Where is God for you? Is he hidden away? Is he a fictitious character? Is he somebody that you just run to when you feel like you have a need? Where is God for you? Where is God? Uh, 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 Moses had a similar vision of God. I want to share with you that Micah saw God lifted up. Amos saw God lifted up. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they saw God lifted up. John on the Isle of Patmos saw God lifted up. When perils come upon God, people, God calls us to look up. When the powers of darkness seem to prevail, God calls us to look up. When the cares of the world seem overwhelming, God calls us to look up. God is still large and in charge. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. It says, We are troubled on every side. I don't know about you, but we are, I go through some struggles and I go through some challenges every time, everywhere you turn back and joke you. You ever heard the statement? Trouble on every side, yet not distress. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are 
persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. God's people are not warriors, we are warriors. Let me say it again. God's people aren't warriors, we are warriors. But I have a problem with the army. <laughs> have a problem with the army because the army doesn't seem to have any artillery what is what I like to say I am saying that we're not armed for battle I am saying that the recruits are being trained I am saying that the soldiers who we enlisted are ensuring that they remain prepared and ready for the army as a matter of fact we look like soldiers going out in our underwear That's the state of the Christian warfare. Nobody is studying their Bible anymore. Nobody is praying anymore. We're only going on on fumes. That's what we're going on by. When was the last time you opened your Bible except when they said scripture reading in church? When was the last time you really went down on your knees and prayed except some stuff? I'm not saying I have a bird church because we, 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 we were soldiers in underwear. We don't have any kind of weapon to fight, to fight this same spiritual battle. That's why when people start to say something good, something about you, let the church and gone. Because you join church, you don't join God. The point I'm making, my brothers and sisters, and this message is for the preacher as well. Because none of us are perfect. None of us. I am saying work on a relationship with God. I am saying that's more important than the degree that you're studying for. I am saying that's more important than the host that you're planning to build. I am saying that it's more important than the man that you're trying to find. Your relationship with God is the most important thing. We need to make the main thing the main thing. Your relationship with God. God's people are warriors. We are warriors. And warriors have to remain fit. Warriors have to remain ready. That when the battle comes, you know, disappointing. This little COVID 19 somewhere come out and you want to wear around, round like whatever. Hello, worse is going to come than COVID 19. So, what you going to do then? If you can't run with the, the footmen, how you going to keep up with the horsemen? Go back to the word. The word of the living God. That's where we need to spend time. Forget about Netflix, spend some time in the Word. Forget about Facebook, spend some time in the Word. The Word. The Word, we need to spend time in the Word. His train filled the temple. The train is the garment of God's infinite glory. No matter how rubbish this world is, you can still look around and see God's glory. When I go out into the garden, I, I shared with the Virgin of Constant Spring last, last month that my, my wife did some planting. We bought some seedlings. And we, we plant them in the little fancy square something, right? And you, you we water them and we water them. And you give up on something because one week pass and not even one something push up. We can have past that even one come up. But when we get to the second week, I start to see some things start to spring up. Amen. Amen. And then I move them from the little something and I plant them in some bigger spaces and stuff. And I go and I water them day and I water them evening. Yeah, yeah. Why do you want to see how they look pretty? Looking good, nothing but the glory of God. I'm saying when you look around, you can see the glory of God anywhere. The point that God was making to Isaiah here is, no matter how things seem dark and grim, when you look around, you can still see my glory. There's still glory. There are still some folks that are in the church that are not about church, they're about God. There's still some people who will go down on their knees and pray, my sister. There's still some people that are reading the word of God. His strength in the temple. His strength in the temple. The serpents literally mean the burning ones. The burning ones. No, they are in the presence of God. Can you imagine being in the presence of God? They had to cover 
cover their faces. They have to cover their faces. They are the burning ones. I remember when Moses went to Mount Sinai. When he came back down, the people couldn't come close to him because he shone so bright. Because he was in the presence of God. I bring the message back home. What kind of shine is going on here? What kind of shine is going on around here? Can the people see the presence of God in you? Can the people see the presence of God in me? That's the question that we're asking. I want us to understand. I want us to understand that God is always on fire. And if you're coming to the presence of God, there are two things that will happen when they come into the presence of fire. One, they either become consumed, or two, they become purified. We say it again. When you come in the presence of fire, you're either consumed or purified. That's why when Jesus comes back, his coming is the brightness of his coming as a slave with you, you know. That's what's going to happen. But I want, I want us to understand that God is always on fire. Do you wonder why the three you people why they were consumed? You ever see fire on the fire? When they put the fire in the fire, that we, all we had is more fire. That's what we had. So the three Hebrew boys were so close to God that when fire came upon them, they said, Chuck, that's a characteristic of mine already, so I'm good. What's going on with us? Are we sticking close to God? Is the fire in us? God wants some people who are burning. God wants some people who are burning. Some people are burning with love for him and the fellow men. Some people are burning with zeal and enthusiasm to go to do good to others. Some people who are burning to just share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why are you so selfish with the message? You think heaven is just for us alone? What a lonely place it would be if I just may alone go for heaven. Wouldn't you want to have others there with you? Why are we so selfish with the word, with the message, with the gospel? Jeremiah in chapter 20 verse 9 says, But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. The seraphims covered their faces in an attitude of reverence before a holy God. Although the seraphims were pure beings, pure than that you can get, they covered their face in the presence of God. We don't have a here yet, but it says, Reverence my sanctuary. Reverence my sanctuary. When we come into the presence of God, we need to have reverence. We need to have reverence. We need to have reverence in our attire. We need to have reverence, reverence in our behavior. We, we, we need to stop being distracted when the word is being presented. It's serious time, brethren. God is speaking to us, and nobody can get the message that is supposed to be for you. And don't look left or look right because the word is not for your neighbor, the word is for you. When this message is done preaching, don't say, boy, oh, okay, my darling, share a word that is good for this, that I'll read. Oh, God, to you. God is speaking to you. Let's stop it. Let's make sure you're not missing it. We need to be careful because we serve a God that is always on fire. The seraphims, they cover their faces in attitude of reverence. But Romans chapter 3 verse 18 says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's what's happening in the world today. No fear of God. Nobody. You know, there's a title being used for the Prime Minister and I'm uncomfortable with it. Comfortable with it. Because everybody has God these days. You have the energy God. You have the godly God. You have the this year God. And that the God now we have broke God. I have a problem with it. I don't know where those sit well with me. And I would never refer to the Prime Minister like that. Because nobody can come close to God. And, 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 and even it's spelled G A D R G O D, I care not. Something I reserve for the Almighty. Something I reserve for the Almighty. In the previous chapters of Isaiah, but I know I have limited time and I know you're suffering under those man. So let me come to the, the crux of the message. Remember, I'm talking about the remedy. 
That's what I'm talking about, the remedy. I'm talking about the remedy for all of our problems. In the previous chapter, chapter 5, let's go to chapter 5. You will see, and I don't have time to read it, but you can read it when you go home. In chapter 5, Isaiah was pronouncing war left, right, and center. War this, and war that, and war, and everything, everybody get a war in Isaiah chapter 5. But when we got to chapter 6, and Isaiah saw himself in the presence of the Lord, he exclaimed, Woe is me! Woe is me! You see, you need to stop the phone the neighbor and stop the one that's a person and the person. Woe is me! For I am undone. What was for you? That's the question. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5 describes us and now he says at the Bible as a matter of fact, turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5. Yes. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5. It says, though, wait a second in your Bible. Well, are that the same in your Bible? Yes. In your Bible it says what? Though hypocrites, that's what it says in the word. Though hypocrites, do what? First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt do what? Have mercy. That's what it says in the word. Thou shalt then see clearly to cast out the mold out of thy brother's eye. Some of us walking around in some two before, and we had to just lay down people. That's what's going on. No, see, not where I'm going for you, but you see everything where I'm going for everybody else. So, 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 there, there are things, you know, guys, sometimes we, we feel like, okay, I'm okay with handling certain things until you get close at the home. So, let me give you an example. So, you and your friend work at the same workplace. And promotion has come up. And before the promotion be out, you know, no good, same way on with lunch and everything, and, you know, everything. Only for years that your friend get the promotion over you. You know them can I eat again? Me know them that God sent Thomas. Yes, man. And that's why them that God sent Thomas. Because at them, me may not get the promotion. Yeah? At them, me may not get the promotion. So you are your friend single. Okay, so that's a plan. You are your friend single. Yeah. The two of them are going and when the guy wanted to cancer. Come on. And you see how like a spurs and the person starts showing like an interest. But you know, say, you know, other things never go nowhere, say, never think it's not going nowhere either. All of a sudden, question, Papa, marriage, I'm a broke. What going to me? Eh? What is going on? All right, so that's not going to work yet either. Come on. Only you two are put together. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Your friend got to go to the and drive me to you now. What's up on her? What's she going to like? Eh? Like she better than anybody else. I remember than anybody else. I am saying when things come close to home, that's why you need to check yourself. Some of us can't be happy with other persons, you know, and people know when you feel. When 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 you when your congratulations are sound like congratulations. When the congratulations sound like why when you say you broke your point, you broke your neck. We need to be more excited for other people. We need to be more excited for other people. When things are going for other people, affirm them, pick them up, thank them. That's what we have to do. Focus on yourself. Who is me for I am undone? When you draw a knight to God, you get a first hand glimpse of how simple you are. Of how simple and insignificant I am. Looking upon God like Isaiah did, you will realize you're nothing next when you compare to eternal. We might be doing well when we compare ourselves to our, brother, to our brothers and sisters sitting beside us. We might be doing well when we compare ourselves to our neighbors. We might be doing well when we compare to our friends that are outside the fold. But when we compare ourselves to our holy God, how do we stand? When we see God more clearly, we see ourselves more clearly. Yes. When we see God more clearly, we see our inadequacies. 
We see our sinfulness. We see we are man and none but us. But God has a remedy. God said, God has a remedy. You see, when you find yourself in your state of woe, oh, God has a remedy. When we think that we can't make it through this pilgrim party, God has a remedy. When you are in despair and in a state of despondency, God has a remedy. If you acknowledge that you've sinned and you've come short, God has a remedy. Amen. If you affirm that you were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, God has a remedy. What is the remedy, Brother Alain? We're talking about the remedy. Let's go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. The remedy. We're talking about the remedy. Isaiah verse 5 says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then, flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which was taken from the top of the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips. And thy iniquity has been taken away, and thy sin has been purged. God has a remedy. The coal from the altar represented the purifying and refining power of God's divine grace. It signified the transformation of character. It, it, it signified Isaiah's desire. Isaiah saw himself as being woeful and undone. Our greatest need today is from the whole, is, is of the holy fire from God. That is our greatest need. Our greatest need is a life call from the altar. Our greatest need, this life call represents Jesus. Whatever the problem you have, I have a remedy for you. Do you have a child that has been wandering far from God like the prodigal son? I have a remedy, life call from the altar. Do you have a spouse who has been giving you nothing but trials and crosses? I have a remedy, life poor from the altar. You have an employer that has been giving you nothing but a hard time. I have a remedy, which is life poor from the altar. A church brother or a church sister that is giving you nothing but problems. I have a remedy, life poor from the altar. You have a besetting sin that you can't tell nobody about. I have a remedy, life poor from the altar. Jesus, Lord, is the remedy. If your problem is loneliness, Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 20, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end. If your problem is money, the songwriter said, My father is rich in houses and lands. He holds the wealth of the world in his hand. If you have a problem with lust, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 said, My God will meet all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. If you need a house, Jesus is your chief cornerstone. If you need food, Jesus is your living bread. If you need physical healing, Jesus is your great physician. If you need education, Jesus is the master teacher. If you need justice, Jesus is the righteous judge of all mankind. If you need defense, Jesus is our shield and our buckler. If you need a solution, Jesus is our problem solver. If you need knowledge, Jesus is our revelator. If you need a response, Jesus is our answer. If you need a way out, Jesus is our way maker. If you need salvation, Jesus is our savior. Jesus is my life code. Jesus is the remedy for all our problems. 